The school board meeting of Tuesday, June 11th is called to order. The first item on the agenda is a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> The first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Ann? I have one adjustment. Um, under new business, could we add vote on interim superintendent? Under new business, interim superintendent. Um, Gail? Yes. Uh, under the um, school board subcommittees and reports, could we add the pool survey committee? Yeah, and I'd also like to add a re quick report on the organizational meeting that we held last night under the school board subcommittees and reports. Charlie. And under new business, uh, we need to take a, a vote on non-collective bargaining salary increases for 96, 97. Okay. Um, I'd also like to say a few thanks right at the beginning. So we will have another adjustment to the agenda of a few thanks um, in just a moment. Are there any other adjustments? Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to thank um, Gail Dransfield for her wonderful organization of the um, reception for Connie Goldman on Sunday. She organized and planned the whole thing with lots of help, but she put many hours in and we truly appreciate all of her work. Thank, oh, you, thank you, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Connie Brown and her daughter were, were very big parts of that. Great. Um, I'd also like to thank James Kittredge and Peter Van Fleet, if they'd come out. <laughs> they have been filming our school board meetings this year, and we really, truly appreciate it. I'll come down and shake <laughs> And then the last thing I want to do, Connie has been recognized a lot on Sunday, so we, we didn't want to do too much else, but this is her last school board meeting, so Connie, come down here for one second. <laughs> <laughs> We have just a little sunflower for you oh, terrific. to plant in your garden so oh, it can grow and bloom beautiful. this summer and you can think of us and we thank you for all of the sunshine you have brought in our, our lives. Thank you. <laughs> thank and we you. wish you the best. Um, this is perfect because uh, last year I had some wonderful sunflowers and I lost the seeds. <laughs> so I've been scrambling around trying to find seeds and this is, this is really great. Um, and I basically want to thank all of you, Gail, you in particular. It was a wonderful afternoon, a little embarrassing. A couple times I felt like kind of crawling under somewhere, but it was um, deeply appreciated. Um, the computer is just unbelievable and I understand I owe a lot thanks to a, a great many people and I really am gonna try to write card, so give me a little time. Um, I remember my first board meeting in Gorham because it was the first woman superintendent in the Portland area. Uh, the paper ran a big picture and said, her first board meeting. I'm awfully glad there's nobody here taking a picture saying, her last board meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Connie. We will miss you. Um, I also wanted to inter introduce George Entwistle, our newest board member. This will be his first board meeting. He was sworn in with me yesterday evening. Thank you, George. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is approval of May 14th school board minutes. I actually think we have two minutes to approve. There was a special meeting on May 10th and then the regular school board minute meeting. Are there any changes? Corrections? Ann? Um, under item four, comments by high school, middle school, and Pond Cove school representatives. <clears throat> it did not mention Megan Barnes, actually, and we probably should mention her by name as, as being there from Pond Cove. Was that, that, that was the month before. It was the month before. Oh, is this just on here by mistake then? Because it says Pond Cove school. 
So I was thinking. Oh yeah, Ponce, last month. just in the title it does. You're right. Yeah. It, it okay. was the month before. That was, it was the month before. The title okay. is mistake. Okay. Megan was here the month before. All right. Well, it's still a correction. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Sorry. Are there any other corrections? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved. Next item is comments by high school and middle school reps. I saw back. Want to go first? Go ahead. Hey, um, on last Friday, June seventh, the seniors graduated. Probably all know and there was 104 graduating seniors. And I was on the soccer field for the second time. It went pretty well, just there was no rain, the weather held up. And the graduates that night went to Project Graduation, which lasted from 8.15 to sometime in the morning, like four or five in the morning. And you know they had a lot to keep themselves <coughs> busy. There was a hot tub and a sauna, a swimming pool. They had a, a magician and massage tables, um, <laughs> casino games. And there was, they had a lot, they had um, live music from the local band at the school and they had a DJ, so and I guess that was a very good success. And the finals for the underclassmen will start on June 19th, and they're gonna be on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, since our last meeting, our boys lacrosse team has won a state title, as well as our girls tennis team, and our girls lacrosse and our boys tennis have been state runners up. And tomorrow, <coughs> our baseball team will play for the West Remain finals at St. Joseph's. And next year, um, the school board representatives will be Matt Lunt and Ryan Kane. Great. We really thank you for doing this this year. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments? Well, I'd like to add that I went to the end of the year uh, concert, band concert and chorus, and thought it was a exemplary job. Very exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Middle school rep. Um, since it's the end of the year, like many activities have been winding down, and beach day is the 21st, and the last dance and social is this Friday. And the fifth and sixth graders um, have been putting on their yearly plays, the challenge classes, and the sixth graders are also doing a links project, which involves cars similar to the solar car sprint, which <coughs> the eighth graders did. And the seventh and eighth grade challenge classes are doing debates while the eighth grade French classes are having the students be teachers on specific topics till the end of the year. And also on the 20th is the eighth grade recognition night um, to rec recognize the completion of middle school and certificates will be given and there will also be selected speakers. Thank you, Alicia. Is, are there any questions? Again, thank you for doing this this year. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, the next item on the agenda is communications. Connie? Uh, well, I think I will put the uh, communication on the Fulbright under that one. I have been able to distribute that to you, so you've had a chance to at least glance at it. And I think I see Paige here. Would you uh, perhaps uh, Paige Brown, who will be going to France and can answer some questions from you. But uh, we are aware, of course, that Paige had applied for the Fulbright exchange teacher program um, way back, I guess, last fall. We received notification a couple of months ago that she was chosen to go forward with that. Um, and now all of those preliminaries are over with and we're down to the wire. Uh, is it absolutely going to happen at this point? I think maybe. I sent my medical forms and um, some other forms. They had received them, and I received a letter today stating that they had received all of my paperwork and that it was official. Now I have a lot of personal um, affairs and things like that to, to handle, which is really overwhelming at this point. But <laughs> officially, it's, it's going to happen. I, I, the board really doesn't have a whole lot of background on exactly where you're going, so this might be a time to share, at least as far as you're aware of uh, what the school and, and the teacher who will be taking your place. Certainly. Um, 
First of all, the exchange teacher from France who will be replacing me here, her name is Giselle Garcia, and she is older than I. Um, she's in her late 40s, I believe, maybe early 50s. She is from southern France in a town called La Seine. It's right on the coast, which is very nice um, for me. Um, a small school comparable to Cape Elizabeth Middle School. She teaches um, the same age children. She teaches English. Um, it, is, it is close to Toulon, which is a fairly big city on the southern coast. And she has all of her arrangements to come here. She will be meeting me in Washington, D.C. for a five-day meeting, August 5th through the 9th. And then we will come back here together for a couple of weeks, and I will introduce her to the region and to some other teachers. And then from there, I will head on over to France and try to make my adjustments uh, at that end. Well, congratulations. I know it's not easy to be accepted into this program. And although I won't be here, I will certainly be thinking of you. And the, um, I, perhaps some of the board members would like to ask questions. Or questions? It's overwhelming at this point for me, um, but uh, I know that it will be worth, worthwhile in the end. And I know that once I get there and once she gets here, it will be so beneficial for this community and for the students. Um, but right now, um, it's kind of, I know, unclear because it's unclear to me. And it is a risk for both, for both teachers involved. But we know that there's a huge reward at the end. It's a, it's a learning risk. Yes. Right. And I, as a French teacher, I know that I need this to immerse myself in the language. Well, we wish you the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great year. Thank you. Are there communications? It's, it, you want to? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was a question. I don't know the answer to that. It was just a question. I was asking whether there was any report from the um, high school reps or Rick or anyone on um, the achievements of the debate team. Didn't Mr. Ely just take the team somewhere? Okay. But they did go to Topeka. Yes, they did. Excellent. Excellent. Great. Well, I hope they did well. Uh, next item on the agenda is superintendent's report. Bonnie? Thank you. Uh, we're starting with a report on the national French contest and the national Spanish exam. Um, you're doing the okay, page back again. I guess that's me again. Uh, okay. Um, my name is Paige Brown. I'm a seventh and eighth grade French teacher at the middle school, and I'm here as a representative of all the foreign language teachers in our school system, grades 4 through 12. Um, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share um, these magnificent results from our students. First, I will briefly describe the competitions, and then I will inform you of the outstanding national and state ranks achieved by our French and Spanish students here in Cape Elizabeth. The National French Test and the National Spanish Exam are both 60-minute national exam examinations designed, written, supported, and disseminated by the members of the American Association of Teachers of France, French and the American Associ Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, uh, otherwise known as the AATF and the AATSP. Their purpose is to stimulate further interest in the teaching and learning of French and Spanish and to help identify and reward achievement on the part of both students and teachers. Students are tested on vocabulary, listening and reading comprehension, grammar, culture, and civilization. Generally, schools select only their top students based on individual class averages to take the exams. Consequently, those who participate in these contests are competing against other very capable Spanish and French students throughout the country. First, I will report the results of the Spanish exam. Ten eighth grade Spanish, student, Spanish students were selected. Their names, Rachel Chang, Chris Falk, Emily George, Betsy Hayes, Jen King, Michael Kaufman, Alex Lankowski, Tiffany Miller, Jennifer Ronsheim, Andy Ro and Andy Rowe. Several of these students placed in the top ten within the state of Maine. Chris Falk and Alex Lankowski tied for first place in the state. Rachel Chang placed, Chang placed third in the state. Emily George placed fourth. Tiffany Miller placed fifth in the state, and Betsy Hayes received a 10th place ranking in the state. Needless to say, we were very pleased with these results. 
Uh, and next I'll talk to you about the French national exam. We had this year 28 eighth grade students who took the Concours National de Français in March. They competed against other middle school and high school students from around the country. Seven students from Cape Elizabeth placed in the top 10% nationally, and a total of 10 students were ranked in the top 20% in the nation. Elizabeth Sullivan ranked second in the nation, level 1A. Alex Watson and Elizabeth Kelsey placed third in the nation on the French exam. Brian White placed fourth, and Sarah Wexler placed fifth nationally. Sullivan, Watson, Kelsey, White, and Wexler all tied for first place in the state of Maine rankings. Lindsey Groff, Emily Austin, Margot Sullivan, and Lori Robinson tied for second place, and Ryan Beaumont placed third in Maine. The other 18 students who, whom I've not mentioned also placed in the state, ranging from fourth place to 11th place. Again, we are extremely proud of these students, and I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd gladly yeah, it's a wonderful, them. wonderful record for both French and Spanish. Mm -hmm. Really congratulate those students. Thank you. They will also be recognized at the end of the year um, for the eighth grade at the eighth grade recognition night. Okay. Well, this sure. is, go ahead. I think it's important for the community to realize how special these programs are. No matter where I go in the state, um, people really want to know how you put a program in place at the fourth grade level that actually teaches uh, substantial language skills, not just a little bit of culture or something of that nature. Um, and I think it's important for the community to understand that a decision that was made several years ago uh, has been implemented. There are a lot of people who deserve credit. Every, and I see a couple of them sitting, Sue Dana is over there, and you, Paige, and of course, Barb Cannell and others who over Suzanne Junell and people who have been operative in this. Um, CAPE is really a leader now in proving that you can teach foreign language to young students. And I'm also extremely proud to tell the community, we don't exclude anybody. Uh, in the old days, when you learned a second language in America, you kind of had to be uh, college material, in quotes. You were allowed to take a foreign language at the ninth grade if your teachers thought that you were going to be going on to college. When you travel around the world and find beggars in the streets who speak English, you kind of wonder what's wrong with our attitudes about the teaching of foreign language. Of course, our kids can learn foreign languages and should be. It is a, a controversial piece of the learning results legislation right now because it is going to take some resources to do the job, and it does take resources here in this town. But the success of the program is really remarkable, and we really should be beating the drum and saying it works and it's worth the investment. And thank you to the teachers, and certainly congratulations to the kids. Terrific. Thank you for your support. Thank, thank you. you. Honey, Whoops. Still, sorry. <laughs> Lost track of where I was doing. And we have a representation from the Arts Committee. I do have a copy of their draft, let's see, I think I have a copy of the draft. Yes, I do right here. Mission statement, Susie Terrian, our esteemed middle school art teacher will be. You should all have copies of the draft, do you all? Yes. We, we almost do. <laughs> oh, coming. <laughs> we do now. <laughs> well, you're not to read them now, you're supposed to listen to me. You can read them later. Okay, now we do. Great. I was, um, Saturday evening, I, I drove up to the middle school to check the kiln about 5.30, and as I turned into the driveway, I saw a parking lot full of cars, and I thought, uh-oh, Connie's reception was today instead of tomorrow. <laughs> I've missed it. And then as I got closer, I heard all the cheering, and I thought, for sure, there must be an arts event that I had missed out on. <laughs> of course, we know it was a softball game. Um, but you know, as as uh, we worked as we worked on the um, the language um, that we're presenting tonight in terms of the mission statement and our core beliefs, um, one of the things that I was reminded of and continue to be reminded of as I get closer and closer to um, 
or more involved in, in the process of thinking through what it is we do, what we want to be doing, um, what we're not doing that we should be doing, and how to draw up a five-year plan and how to, how to think about the future in the arts in Cape Elizabeth. Um, uh, I do look to the vitality that the sports exhibit in, and um, the energy and the commitment, uh, and I think that there is a message there for, for us. I also look at what we've written and what we've talked about, and I think there are messages in our belief statements that apply to all areas. And um, as Nancy Hutton and I have, have, have spoken, talked um, about recently, there, uh, we have no, the arts have no, no corner on creativity. Um, however, creativity is something that should be infused into all areas of the curriculum. And of course, through cross-disciplinary work, the, um, the arts can help to do that. Um, I first want to thank the people who have served on the committee, uh, the committee members in the community who are here tonight um, include Tina Harnden, Kate Borson, and Pat Myers, and we truly appreciate um, their work. Would you three stand for a moment, just so we know who you are? <laughs> These are committed parents. It's very... Their, their input is extremely valuable. Judy Lardner and Kitty Coughlin have also served earlier on the committee. Um, and Carla has been with us. Uh, and, um, and Keith with her all earlier. And we look forward to having a consistent board representation from now on out. Um, beginning in September, we met monthly. We, we've been meeting for a year approximately. Our first meeting was at the end of the school year last year. And um, beginning this September, we met monthly um, to write the mission statement and belief statements um, we're presenting tonight. Um, our discussions have been broad. Uh, we've worked to grasp the many concerns committee members have expressed. Um, lately, we've been um, meeting more regularly, weekly, um, with, in small groups. And uh, we've worked to um, craft the, with the appropriate language the, um, to give the mission and vision statements the sound that um, the, uh, we think that these statements for the arts should have. Trying to be inclusive, referring to a variety of relevant pre-existing documents, we've discovered that in some respects it is necessary to reinvent the wheel. That as you get closer to what you're doing, as you um, become invested in it, you, um, you don't want to use what's already out there, particularly because uh, this is tailored to the specific needs of this community and we do know that sometimes uh, documents of this nature look almost too pared down, too simplistic, too, I'm not sure that refined is the, is the right word. And so I like the fact that ours sounds perhaps, um, it appeals to uh, an audience that, that we know will understand what we're saying. I, I want to, however, emphasize that this is a draft and, and we anticipate your input as we continue to work on it. Um, we hope that the language and tone of this draft reflects our concern for the individual, for cognition, for developmental approaches, for history, tradition, and community, um, for authentic assessment, and for the value that the knowledge, skills, and attitudes gained in a strong education in the arts um, uh, will extend into other areas of learning and into life beyond school. So, we, oh, before I put on the overhead, um, we, our plans for the future are to meet in the summer to work on a five-year plan of a few staff members. Uh, hopefully we'll have a couple of workshop days or workshop mornings to, um, to work together to continue this work to not let it drop for the summer. And, um, and then in the fall, we'll come back to you with a five-year plan. Are there any questions up, up to this point? Really appreciate the work. I love seeing all of these mission statements and visions of where we're going. And it is it's very nice for me also to see. It's, ni it's, it's been interesting to see the parallels. Mm -hmm. And also in hearing people's reports, um, the work that's been done on the other system-wide committees to realize how we are on the same wavelength. And there are so many interconnections, so many ways in which they dovetail. Um, as I was saying to Connie just today, I believe one of the things that I realized so clearly this year in assigning a, a paper for eighth graders to do is um, the importance in terms of research of teaching kids how to, how to go about asking um, the right questions. 
And so I think a lot of our, a lot of what we're doing crosses over subject areas. Thank you, Susie. Maybe leave it on a minute so that they could actually maybe read through it or whatever. And I have like other problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions from the board or comments, <coughs> Charlie? I, th I think the the mission statement should be read. I, I, I really could. Yeah. Have. Okay. Yeah. Great, Susie. Do you want to read it? I also really want to thank Nancy St. John for keeping us on task. <laughs> Not an easy job. <laughs> we have lots to talk about. Um, we believe that the experiences of creating, performing, and interpreting in the arts are essential to the education and personal growth of all students. The mission of the Cape Elizabeth School community will be to create and, sus and sustain substantive arts programs that provide opportunities for students to create meaning from experience. This process develops the discipline, imagination, and critical thinking and problem-solving skills needed for academic success and to prepare for a lifetime of productive and satisfying choices. Having done some of this work, I know every word is usually labored over, so I appreciate Well, I, I told Hayden that would today as he was reading over my shoulder and, and, and while I was in the computer lab, and he said, are you writing for the layman? And I said, Hayden, you're either my best friend or my worst enemy. <laughs> but he was actually quite instrumental in, in changing a couple of words. And that was great because, in fact, I realized after he said that that, I, that a layman had not read this. I hadn't passed it around. I, um, I mean, this, there, we worked on this in committee, but I've done some, some changes some, uh, in the last couple of weeks, few in the, over the weekend, actually adding um, an item on assessment in particular. Uh, and then after Hayden's comment, I, I faxed it to my, my son, who's a copy editor. And, uh, <laughs> and in fact, he reinforced Hayden's comments, so we're talking about two people who use words all the time, and that was, that was helpful. Thanks. Well, thank you, Susie. Are there any other questions? Uh, just, just quickly, uh, when we started the committee a year ago now, uh, many members of the committee, I think, had the feeling that maybe we didn't really need to do this. We all knew what each of us were doing, and, and, uh, and it's great to see that this committee has evolved into looking across the district and concerned about all the areas of the arts, and uh, I think this uh, mission statement is terrific. And, Hopefully we can continue to refine it and get it exactly the way that everybody wants it. Thank you, Susie. Thank you to the whole committee, everybody who worked on it. And we look forward to your further work in this area. I would, uh, I've been struck by the way in which the various groups that have been working on their own sort of mission and vision statements uh, with an eye to keeping them consistent with the overall umbrella mission and vision statement and beginning to see, I think, how that works. We really started with the smaller piece with the technology. Um, well, I guess backing up, we really started with the mission statement for the whole district, uh, which we knew was imperfect and would be revised, and we have that later on our agenda tonight. But when you take, you take the draft state, or take the statement from the technology plan, the technology mission and vision, uh, we have, and I have distributed with you during the year, a. Uh, mission and vision statement from the science and math NSF planning grant we've been dealing with. Uh, now we have this one. Um, the health and guidance group is also working on it. I think it will be really interesting to put those out, looking at how they go together and to reinforce what Susie was saying, that you begin to see conceptually how learning cuts across disciplines, cuts across uh, the sometime artificial barriers we tend to set up in school and that of course is what we've got to understand in the information age. You can't teach everything anymore if you ever could uh, it's, but it's patently impossible now. So this is a phase I would or, you know, I would see as going on uh, 
as people get better and better at seeing how you do it. So uh, I applaud the work. Um, I wasn't sure you'd get there either, <laughs> but I knew you would get there. I just wasn't sure exactly how. And it's beautiful. It's lovely stuff. And it says something about an aspect that isn't easy to put on a math and science vision statement. But the interesting thing will be to see, take the technology and the math and science and the health and guidance and the arts and put them together and see what, what comes out of that. I think it'll be powerful. Thank you. Are we going to move on? My favorite part of the evening, IASA. Um, <laughs> I fussed about that all year long. Um, we had a meeting la at the end of last month. Now, for those of you for whom it's just an acronym, I'm trying to remember. Mary, what does that stand for? International Association. Yeah, see, Nancy knows. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to make up some. Improving America's School Act. Uh, it, no, I know that's right. I know that's right. Um, this is a result of legislation at the federal level, which has also been reflected at the state level. And it's one of those things that sometimes you feel is just a bureaucratic exercise. In order to get federal monies, we uh, have to fill out certain forms. And I've included the text that will be on those forms, so we haven't had time to type them into the forms. Nevertheless, as we went through this process, we simply took the work we were doing. We didn't happen to have a um, uh, everything we're doing, but we, for instance, Susie was there representing the Arts Committee, and we had people representing the Reading Committee and the Research Strand and the uh, Math and Science Grant, uh, as well as the, re the work we were doing on rethinking the mission statement. Um, and frankly, all that we, we're being required to do is put down our planning, the fact that we have to fill certain slots to, to satisfy their um, bureaucratic issues uh, is a little difficult, and I, I apologize for giving you some material that is um, perhaps wordier than it should be, but uh, it's partly because of the requirements of the form. Nevertheless, in boiling down the four main goals, they will be very consistent with what you already are working on. Um, what I do need from you tonight <coughs> is a vote that you accept in principle this plan. I realize that you haven't had time to um, check every word or every concept, but I don't think that's the point. The point is that this is consistent with the way this district is going. Um, each of the committees that we have, have working on various projects were represented and put down certain pieces, and my contribution was to try to uh, synthesize that as best I could, and that's where the four goals, some of the action steps, and the general uh, background information uh, on vision and student-centered instruction and assessment come from. It's entirely possible that this may be a useful document for the board in your yearly goal setting process. I certainly wouldn't want to have anybody think, I think you have to stick to it totally as it is, but it's a representative statement and I do need a, um, for our record keeping, I do need a vote from you that you, I hope, we can, can accept it in concept. I just wanted to say that we need to do this so that we get our approximately $47,000. Um, and so we need that $47,000 is nothing to, nothing to push aside. Well, I think, I mean, in all fairness, the, the planning process is a healthy one. Yes. We are doing it in a somewhat different way from the way the state had envisioned it. So um, the bottom line, trying to squish our process into their forms always creates a little bit of a problem, but that's why this looks the way it does. If I were just putting out our process in ways that are totally uh, reflective of our particular work groups, it wouldn't read in quite such a discursive manner, but I had to use their forms. So do you need a motion, Connie? Yes, I do. Is there a motion? And thank you. I <laughs> move. Boy, Connie, people are just leaping to <laughs> vote on this. Um, I move that we accept, um, what's the official name of this? IASA? The IASA plan as presented. Is there a second, Priscilla? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. We appreciate you tying this up for us. <laughs> Well, I was tempted not to, but I, I know my, my, my <laughs> guilt wouldn't let me go without doing it. Um, and finally, tonight, <clears throat> under my report, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to 
push forward the teacher recognition um, materials that we actually began last year. Um, I, have, I have several pieces here. I'll try to get them um, in place. First of all, um, Steve Conley informed me this week that he had received a letter, which I'll pass out to you. Uh, Steve, you remember, was our runner-up, uh, third runner-up, one of three runner-ups for the Teacher of the Year for Maine. We were very proud of him. And he has continued to, um, uh, actually, this process is not Teacher of the Year. This is. Uh, just to read you the statement, on behalf of the State Selection Committee for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Science Teaching, it is with great joy I inform you that you've been selected as a 1996 Maine State Level Awardee. Congratulations. Your application packet has been forwarded to the National Science Teachers Association for the national selection process, which will occur this summer. Past awardees have heard the outcome of this process in fall or perhaps winter. Uh, congratulations again. It might be of service to you. Be contacted at, at the number from Tom Keller, Science Education Specialist from the State of Maine. When I talked to Steve, he was a little unclear exactly what this level of award brings. And we believe it brings some money for the school to support science teaching. And it also puts his name in the running from the State of Maine as a um, uh, possible winner of the Presidential National Award. Um, I have tried to get in touch with Tom Keller myself so I could be a little more precise about uh, some of the details, but whatever. Congratulations, Steve. It's terrific. Congratulations. And I also want to share with you, this is a list of the teachers who this year and actually for in preceding years have been giving time and supporting the effort in new standards. Nancy Hutton is really our resident expert in this. New standards is a national uh, effort to really pull together actual precise standards based on student work. Uh, Nancy has a couple of times explained some of those projects to you. You will notice that this letter is thanking Nancy, Barbara Powers, Craig Roberts, Therese Roberts, Deb Twombly, and Sue Welch, all teachers who have been part of the work to review a variety of student assessment packages. And I believe firmly it is work that will be actually used not only in our own classrooms, but is contributing to a statewide effort. Is there something I should add to that, Nancy? I, I don't think so, except I would say that um, Sue Welch is also one of your resident experts because both Sue and I are on the leadership team, not just me by myself. We um, also, the new standards team will be working with the learning results to help develop some assessments. So that's the next step where the team works. But all of the materials and the work that people have done, we will see evidenced in our own classrooms and in our own local school districts. So it's been an exciting project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is emphasizing student work and the whole problem of actually assessing, um, if, you know, we can use the word grade if you want, but this is different from grading papers in the sort of traditional way. This is actually teaching kids standards that they can learn and apply to their own work. It's a very exciting and growing field. You're going to hear a lot more about it. And finally, for t teacher awards tonight, oh, I, not, almost finally, not quite finally. Um, I want to recognize and thank Betsy Wiley, who took on a project. We had a matching grant from the Lark Society for the Portland String Quartet. They have been meeting with the social studies and English departments in some of the classes at the high school. Um, and part of the grant, their last project is uh, actually tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Cape Elizabeth High School Auditorium will be a concert free for the public, for the community as part of that grant. And they are, as you know, a wonderful group. I do know the baseball game mm -hmm. is tomorrow. Um, well, you know, sometimes families split up. <laughs> and somebody can go to one, somebody can go to the other, whatever. Um, but I, I think Betsy certainly deserves a lot of recognition for working on that project. It, it wasn't easy to get it all, all the details worked out. And for the, in your packet, I had uh, given you a list of teachers, and I've also given this to the courier, <laughs> along with a little additional information about these people, and it will be in the next uh, article. Um, 
along with a list of people at the town side who have been recognized for service. And since ours is a fairly long list, I'm gonna get right with it. As you recall, our teacher recognition project, which is also total staff recognition, we, don't, we do include people who are not teachers, uh, and we go at five-year increments, recognition of service. So our five-year group this year, reaching uh, that, that point, Bill Bruington, Sue Dana, Kurt McCandless, Lorraine Orlando, who actually works in the central office, Linda Paul, Susan Richman, Janice Robinson, who's in our food service, and Gigi Zimperich have reached that point. We also are recognizing uh, people who've given 10 years of service to the district, Gail Adshead at the high school, Karen Allen at Community Services, along with Barbara Cummings, who actually, I think we made a mistake, she's been here 11 years, I realized. Um, Julie Mullins, Julie Robbins, Wanda Stalling, and Ingrid Stressinger, who are Pond Cove teachers. Then uh, people who are reaching the 15-year mark, Earlene Jackson, the secretary, one of the secretaries at the middle school, Sally Martin, English department at the high school, currently English chair, and Linda Nappy, teaching in Pond Co. Uh, we have one person reaching the 20 year mark this year, Dick Mullen, who of course is an English and drama teacher, as well as having given many years of, of his time to speech and debate, as well as to drama. And this year we have three people reaching the 25 year mark. Dottie Anderson, who is currently in second grade, uh, has also been a team leader, has taught other grades, and also I believe early on taught at Cape Cod at uh, Cottage Farm School. Buddy Earl, who has been mostly in the middle school um, and uh, just a terrific person as far as that age level goes and Clark Smith also at the fifth grade level and both Buddy and Clark over the years have been team leaders and taken other extracurricular. So this is an opportunity to say thank you. It's an impressive list. It's a lot of years. I didn't think to add it all up, but it's a huge investment for the children and young people of Cape Elizabeth. We thank you. And I would also like to say that uh, part of this recognition program Last year when we, we started it, we thought, well, it'd be nice to get everybody here in the June board meeting, but it's not a real good time of, of the year. Teachers are sort of trying to get things over with. So we've chosen instead to give out the awards that go with this list the opening day of school in August. Actually, it will be um, in August this year. Um, it's a time of great energy, and I think just about everybody sitting at this, this table last Last September, uh, we gave out, I think, 156 mugs, lot, wasn't yeah. it? It was an electric moment. It really was. And so I think the process works very well when you do it. That It's kind of too bad not to have everybody here right now, but it, I think it works better in the fall. So congratulations and thanks. And on behalf of the board, I would really like to thank all of those teachers for their years of service and other teachers who are not on this list, but all the teachers this year. Thank you. And that's my stuff. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, school board subcommittees and reports. Charlie Finance Subcommittee. Uh, we met <coughs> at 6.30 in the chamber conference room. We signed the warrants. Uh, we reviewed the fund balances and su su suggested expenditures. Um, we will have a general, an estimated general fund balance of about 80,000 and a use of facilities of about 10,000. We looked at some possible purchases out of that estimated fund balance of looking at a school bus purchase, a floor burnisher for the high school, a high school gym curtain replacement, and middle school mat, wall mats. Um, we also reviewed building project um, um, balances and may realize about 67,000. Uh, again, looked at possible bleacher replacement in the middle school gym. Uh, a re-roofing of the 1930s building, uh, looking at middle school lockers in the gym, additional lockers, and also looked at replacing uh, some existing exterior Ponco doors. Um, we also reviewed community services requests for salary and benefits, and we also looked at non-collective bargaining salary increases for central office community services. Um, we will do a a vote action later on those two items. Um, we reviewed the Russian Chinese regional program, which there was some misunderstanding about our budget action this year. And Scott shared with us the audit schedule, which will start July 1st. Thank you, Charlie. Any questions? 
Uh, next committee is Superintendent Search Committee. Ann? Well, I'm pleased to say we are making progress in this regard. Um, since our last meeting, um, we uh, had decided at that time to go out for an interim for one year. We did advertise for that position. We also obtained from the Maine School Management Association a list of uh, potential candidates for the job. We ended up with about 12 candidates. Um, we, uh, the board, board members interviewed five of them, um, decided on three finalists who we brought back um, just yesterday. And I'm pleased to say we do have a candidate um, to vote on tonight under new business. Thank you, Ann. I'm glad we, we we'll are We'll keep people in suspense a little longer. <laughs> I know. Um, technology Committee. Charlie or Keith? Uh, the, the Technology Committee has actually had two meetings since our last board meeting, and I will report on the last one, which took place on um, June 10th, yesterday. Um, we uh, essentially reviewed the system-wide technology resource coordinator um, to report on that. We had about 40 applicants for that position. There is a interviewing team of Jay Sherma, Connie Goldman, and myself who met also yesterday and whittled that down to 13 possible candidates and will start interviewing on Friday, uh, six of those 13. Um, there was some direction set by, by the board to some degree and also this interviewing committee that this will be a central office position with an extended letter of employment. And we also looked at things that we would be looking for in the interview process besides what the tentative job description is. And we can essentially be looking at somebody who is a visionary and, and can bridge um, technology you know, into the next century, um, looking for someone who really can come into a new type position, someone who has some staff development uh, experience, um, somebody who has some foresight and intuition of where the future is going in technology, essentially someone who is well read. We're looking for somebody who has people skills, um, somebody who has some strong budgeting skills and also has licensing knowledge and ability to monitor contracts. And also part of this job will be documentation and maintaining of logs and equipment, and et cetera, system-wide. So these are kind of the areas that we will be looking at when we do the interviewing process. Um, Jay will concentrate on the technical aspect. Um, Connie will concentrate on the, essentially the education aspect, and I will talk will concentrate more on the visionary and the systemic uh, vision. Uh, we also had a representative from um, Coastal Computer who is also doing um, our review, uh, is actually doing a review of our, of our, uh, of our system, and specifically the high school, but actually town-wide of, of, of doing networking wiring. Uh, he did a report to us. Um, what has come about is some conversations with Time Warner who, who can provide us at the same cost uh, and the basic leasing fees that 9X will of uh, being able to use the uh, fiber optics cables that are already in place, which gives us a faster uh, a speed of, of transmission of of information than the 56K, which is proposed by 9X. So there was, I believe, a meeting today with a representative from Time Warner with specific key people from um, all areas of, of the town and school. Uh, so we are looking at that as an option, a more viable op option. And we also review the acceptable use policy and um, there are going to be some revisions made and that will be forwarded on to the um, policy subcommittee. And that is essentially it. Thank you, Charlie. Any questions? The next committee is the Athletic Study Committee. I'm not sure who's reporting. Did you bring your notes Well, I, I brought my notes Thank because you. I figured nobody else would. Um, the Athletic Study Committee had its first meeting on May 21st. 
Um, just to refresh people's um, memory, this committee was basically formed to look at the philosophy, management, and uh, funding of school athletic pro programs. That's a constant issue in the budget process, and so we decided to bring together kind of an, a representative group um, to talk about those issues to help us with the budget process um, next year. Um, Connie attended several board members, um, principals, um, people from the athletic department, community services, and representatives from uh, the boosters and parent groups. Um, at this meeting, we talked a little bit about you know, where we were going to go with this uh, committee and what our timeline would be. Right now we're in the process of collecting a whole bunch of information, both internally about rules and regulations and, you know, how we do things, where the boosters get their money, what they spend it on, handbooks for coaches, job descriptions, all that kind of thing. And also um, we're checking with area communities. We decided on um, a group of about 10 schools who we participate in athletics from to get, you know, comparable information from them. And we're also um, contacting booster organizations in those communities to see how they fundraise, what, they're, what they spend money on, how they're organized, <clears throat> and that type of thing. That information is all supposed to be collected by the end of this month. And um, then we'll spend basically July putting it together, disseminating it, and our next meeting will be August 21st, 7 o'clock in the evening at 1226 Shore Road. And at that time, we'll kind of organize assignments. Um, but our, our timeline is to, uh, to really have um, some kind of recommendations and structure um, for the budget process in the, um, you know, in the late, late fall. Um, we are planning on having some kind of public workshop maybe in October or November, so there'll be plenty of opportunity for um, public input. And if anybody has any questions, they can call um, board members. And excuse me, I seem to be losing my voice all the time. <laughs> Does anybody have any, any questions? Any questions? Gail, Ann, and I were there, and we'll be involved. <clears throat> um, the next item is the policy subcommittee. Back to you, Ann. This is my last policy <laughs> um, report since Gail Transfield is going to take over chair of this committee. And congratulations, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, last, we last met on May 23rd, which was right in the aftermath of uh, the prom situation. And as promised, we, we looked at some policies um, that pertained um, to that situation and the ongoing um, problems that we've had in that area. We did review our existing drug abuse policy, and we decided actually the policy is totally fine the way it is. It just needs to be enforced um, so that we're not proposing any changes to that. Um, the, only, the only thing that might happen is I think Rick was, was thinking about maybe changing um, the internal administrative punishments for various infractions, but I, we haven't talked about that since then, so I don't know. Nothing's been done. Okay. Um, we also talked about having a new policy, um, which, we, which we're calling school sponsorship of social activities, and the, and the point of that policy is to share responsibility for social events that occur outside of the, um, of the school day with parents in the community in some you know, structured way, and uh, we'll go through that. Um, later under new business as first reading. And then we also had a um, quite a lively discussion about the co-curricular and extracurricular uh, program policy, um, which currently uh, encourages students to participate in athletics and, and co-curricular activities, but doesn't require them to you know, be passing all their courses. And we had a very lively discussion with um, you know, a variety of opinions expressed on that. So tonight under first reading, we will have two options um, for discussion. And lastly, um, we, we talked about the affirmative action policy. And just to clarify, what you have in your packet is um, the entire affirmative action plan that we saw in February. What is actually for first reading is the, is the first page of that policy. So that, that was that. And I don't think we have a meeting set at this point, and we'll have to let people know. Yeah, we'll let Gail schedule the next meeting. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Thank you for serving as policy, policy chair. We appreciate all of the hard work. Um, the next item is the pool subcommittee report, and Gail's going to report on that. 
Yes, thank you. Um, the pool survey committee has had two meetings. We were charged by um, the town council and the school board to start to investigate our pool facility. And, and we really are just at the point of investigating. And I'd like to announce that the members of that committee are Mike McGovern, Rosemary Reed, Karen Dunphy, Scott Poulin, Sue Weatherby, and myself. Um, we are now looking at getting some uh, proposals to just uh, uh, investigate what is and what needs to be done in our pool. We have sent out a survey that was an insert in the last Cape Courier and have asked people um, in the community to fill it out and, and return it to community service, town hall, or the Cape Pool so that we could have the input on what the community sees as needs or um, what their feelings are about how we're going to go about this project. We had our last meeting on the um, 16th of May, and our next meeting will be Tuesday, June 18th. Um, and we're going to start collecting our surveys and see if we have any reports back from Mike McGovern. But this is just to let people know tonight that we have begun and nothing is going to happen until we have investigated thoroughly. Thank you, Gail. Um, the next committee is, or the next report is on the organizational meeting that was held um, yesterday evening after the swearing in. Um, I was elected as school board chair for the next year. Charlie Greer will be the finance chair again, and Gail will be the <coughs> policy chair. Anne has agreed to be in chair of the superintendent search, which will begin again um, in the fall. And um, we have many other committee assignments. I don't have my list here of all of them, and I'm not sure we need to read them, or unless Connie has it. Mm -hmm. I put a copy of it at everybody's right place. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you. Um, on the finance subcommittee, Charlie Greer will be the chair, Keith Witherall and George will be the members. On um, policy, Gail will be the chair, Ann and Priscilla on that committee. Arts committee will be Keith Witherall, athletic fee committee, Priscilla, athletic study, Ann, Gail, and Beth, co-curricular fee committee, Charlie Greer, community, co community coalition, George Entwistle, health guidance, Ann Chapman and Beth Courier, Let Legislative Liaison Contact Person, Priscilla, Maine School Board Association Delegate, Charlie. Negotiations will be appointed in the fall. Pool Study Committee, Gail. PRVTC General Advisory Board, Charlie. Research Strand, Gail. Staff Development, George Beth. Superintendent Search, Ann Chapman will be the chair. Technology Committee, Charlie and Keith and um, there are a number of ad hoc committees that get called as the year goes on. George will be on the Affirmative Action Committee. Priscilla will do the Sabbatical Leave Committee. Um, members available for the Positive Action Committee meetings will be George, Gail, Beth, and I think Ann, you said you would too. Yeah. Ann also. Um, and the Calendar Committee, um, it's Charlie, Beth, and Ann. And um, we also discussed a plan for some summer meetings. We set some dates. Um, school, from individual board members, school board goals will be due at the end of this month, Friday, June 28th. And then we will have a workshop on Friday, July 12th from 8.30 to 12 in the morning to update those goals and consolidate them and we will be working with the new interim superintendent. Then on Tuesday, August 20th, we plan to have um, a meeting with the administrators and a joint goal setting session. You didn't know about that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we will, the board will then meet from 4 to 5.30 to review the superintendent search um, process as we would begin it again in the fall. Uh, we would have an informal sandwich dinner and then proceed with the finance committee and the school board meeting all on that same night, Tuesday, August 20th. There would not be a school board meeting in July. That is not the normal second Tuesday for August. It's actually the third Tuesday. So that would be Tuesday, August 20th. And um, Anne has already mentioned, but on Wednesday, August 21st, the Athletic Study Committee would be meeting 
And then we would be back on our regular school board schedule with Tuesday, September 10th as the second Tuesday. Um, other than that, I don't think we discussed anything else. Um, board roles and responsibilities um, and a little orientation for our newest board member. Any questions? No. Um, the next, That's, oh. You asked me to check to see if we could have the August meeting mm -hmm. here, and we can't. We can. There's a planning board meeting that night, so we'll have to have it in another location. Great. Well, we have done the high school library before. We can find another location, but I think we'll stick with that date. Thanks, Mary. Um, going on, unfinished business, Connie? And as we have been reporting on again, off again, I guess all year, the focus groups, the follow-up discussions, finally some small groups, um, but I guess you'd call wordsmithing, and here is a, for a first reading, a revised mission statement. Cape Elizabeth students will become informed, responsible citizens through a rigorous education supported by a school and community partnership, and that's followed by statements about what Cape Elizabeth students will demonstrate, and also statements about what Cape Elizabeth schools will do. Um, the point that we have made before in some of our summary reports is that we thought our previous statement was most powerful in its statement of supporting a rigorous educational process. Um, but we did feel that it was missing actually the word student and that it was important, especially in view of the learning results legislation, to make sure that that is front and center. We also have uh, become increasingly aware of the key importance of, of supporting um, school and community partnerships. I think that's going to be uh, a larger piece of a lot of our thinking as we go along or as the school systems go along. Uh, so this is sort of in the nature of um, a draft and a first reading and um, I'm assuming that you will be talking about it more in the fall. Thanks. We're going to try to get it out to the community, to the Cape Courier. It is in an article in the Courier for the next meeting. Right, and we appreciate any feedback. Next item uh, on the, oh, sorry. I, ju I just would like to thank Connie and Beth and Anne and I believe Tom, Tom, Tom was a key person in this for sentence. really finishing this up before Connie left. Um, this has been a goal of mine for about the last three years is to revisit the mission statement and, and I'm glad that the focus groups took place this year and, and that we were able to come to some resolution. There was a lot of good information from those focus groups. Even though you don't get a whole lot of people in them, you get a lot of, of uh, key information. I'm going to make sure that those are kept. I'm frankly throwing a lot of my background paperwork out. but. Uh, I'll make sure that those notes are kept and available to the new superintendent so that when that person um, is working that they can uh, use that as a reference. Thank you, Connie. Um, under new business, um, why don't we do the interim superintendent vote to start with? Anne, would you like to? What everybody has been waiting for. Yeah. Um, I'm pleased to um, nominate Dr. Cynthia Moles. Um, to be our um, interim superintendent starting July 1st. Um, Dr. Moles um, has a BA um, from the University of New Hampshire. Um, she's done a lot of graduate work in administration uh, guidance and organizational development at um, UNH, and she has a master's and a doctorate in education from Boston University. She has uh, been starting at the beginning a, an elementary teacher in, in uh, several grades, a director of guidance in New Hampshire, an educational consultant for the New Hampshire Department of Education, and superintendent of schools in New Hampshire, and then in Saco and Dayton, Maine. And um, most recently, she served as superintendent of schools as an interim in Oxford Hills. Um, and she's also done a lot of uh, teaching at the college level and given a lot of workshops. Um, we've, we've talked to her twice. Um, she's very impressive. She has a good understanding of, of our needs. And so I'd like to move that we um, accept Dr. Cynthia Moles as our interim superintendent from July 1, 1996 to June 30, 1997. I second that. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? 
seven zero. And I will be sure to call her tomorrow because I know Cynthia and I'll be happy to work with her. Great. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> it was her first question. Will Connie be available to talk to me? I said yes. Great. Um, and thanks to all the other candidates who applied and the ones we spoke with. Um, we, it was a very quick process, but um, it was nice to have it wrapped up. As quick. Um, next item, um, Charlie, do you want to make your finance motion? We'll do the two. Okay. Um, I would move for the 96 97 um, budget year a 3% increase in salary to non collective bargaining salary uh, in the central office and community services, and also a additional 1% for the director of community services for an additional service that she will be providing for the school district and the town in, in scheduling of fields. Second. Second, Keith. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you, Charlie. Um, next item is superintendent's nomination for a teaching position for 96 97 school year. The one in your packet is Linda Alfiero for the full time kindergarten position. You have uh, already a uh, summary of her. Resume, she has, of course, been teaching with us uh, mostly part-time. That is one kindergarten section, although she did finish out the year um, this year, pulling in the two sections when we had a resignation earlier in the year. I'm also passing out to you some information, whoops, sorry, um, on a nomination we have for the part-time music position at middle school. This is a time of year when people are being interviewed and uh, I apologize for not having it in your packet, but you can take a minute to look at it. You will see that she comes uh, with good experience uh, and stand that the teachers interviewing her, including our two music directors, are very enthusiastic about her background as well as your enthusiasm. Uh, so that it is with uh, distinct pleasure I can nominate both of these teachers for your vote tonight. And the music teacher is Joanne Lee. I neglected to name her. Tommy, a question? Mm -hmm. it, is this music teacher for the, um, the high school course? No, this is just the middle school yeah. position. It is, it is. Oh, she is doing it is. Actually, right. Um, the interview team was Norm Richardson, Tony Baffa, Rebecca Wing, and me. And we talked with candidates yesterday. And it is for the course position at the high school and then the halftime position at the middle school. So in total, it's a seven-tenths position. Okay. Would she also be doing the chorus for the fifth and sixth grade? Um, those are um, co-curricular stipended positions. And she and Rebecca Wing will talk that through and work that. And I believe, yes, she is interested in at least one of those, if not both of them. Um, is there a motion? Can we just have a motion? I need yeah, I know. I, it's hard. Thank you. I mean, we'll we, can, we can approve the, the teaching, the other teaching position, but I think we need time to look at this. Yeah, I agree with you. Why don't we just take a minute and look at it, and then maybe we sure. can do them together. I do have a question, and I don't know how to address this about her qualifications. 
and I don't know if we should table it. I have, con I have, I, I'm looking at her experience, and I have some, I'm in knowing what the job is going to entail, and I need to know what experience she's had in in high school choral. Mm. Well, we can, of course, uh, and I do appreciate it's difficult when you get things at the last minute. Obviously, we're all under a time crunch here, and the teachers trying to, or the interview team trying to bring it in, um, would like to have a decision so that we can go forward and have people on staff. What I would suggest, since uh, we are scheduled for a... Um, Monday. Well, we are, yeah, we are, but the other, you, you have two choices. One. You have uh, an executive session, unless you intend to cancel it. No, we are going to do that. Um, and that would give us a, a few minutes before going in or coming out so, so I can answer your questions. Uh, and when we come out of executive session, we can take a vote. Or if you feel that you need more time than that, we can obviously uh, deal with this Monday when we have a special meeting. Uh, unless you have more information than what's provided here, I don't think you can answer that question tonight. Plus, I have, you know. I don't know. I mean, I would like to have a chance to confer with Nancy since she's the principal person here. And I do apologize for coming in with things at the last minute. I know that's difficult for you. And I appreciate your uh, wanting to be able to answer full questions. And we try to avoid this kind of situation. Um, why don't we table that one and vote on the kindergarten position so we can move on? And then when we have a break, we can. You can ask, and I will see what I can do to make a decision based on that. That'd be great. Thanks. Thank okay. um, do I have a motion on the kindergarten teacher? Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I move the approval of Linda L. Alfiero as a kindergarten teacher for the academic year 96-97. Be a full time. Is full time. Yes, it is full time. Yes, thank you. Second. Second. Keith, any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. On consideration of co curricular fee positions for 96 97. And you have in your packet two fairly extensive sheets, unless there's some particular reason for me, I'm not going to read them all. If you have any questions, we can proceed with those. Those are by our contract. We are supposed to really issue these contracts by, I think it's the 5th of June. I have mentioned um, in, without any particular attempt at negotiation to the Teachers Association that it might be wise if we could change that wording so it says following the June board meeting because many of these things take time. For instance, on the co-curricular uh, stipends, we start a meeting usually in late March, but it sometimes takes us two or three meetings to determine um, any adjustments we need to make, <coughs> excuse me, in the hours, as well as uh, the building principals to go through their process to um, find candidates for team leadership positions and so forth. Um, and at the athletic end of it, we sometimes uh, have to advertise, of course, in come through that process so I don't know if that will happen but we're a little late on the date so that's why they're here today anyway are there any questions for Connie on any of these is there a motion you could vote on the two of these together Somebody willing to make a Wait, motion? Wait, can I, well, can I just say if we're gonna do athletics now too, are we advertising for these positions right now? Is there anything still out, Rick, at this point? I know we have been advertising, but I don't know what's still the status of all of them. Yeah, all of the ones that are not filled in were advertised in last Sunday's paper. Yeah. And these are all people we've seen before. I take it. They, okay. All right. Is there a motion? All right. I move that we um, accept the co-curricular and athletic um, fee positions as stated in the 
to lengthy lists. <laughs> I second that. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Next item is um, policies, first reading. And I'm going to okay. turn it back to you. Um, as I said earlier, we are not discussing the, the drug policy. Um, we decided that was okay, um, as, as is. Um, I guess my, my only question to, um, to Rick at this point is, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is um, I distributed a memo to the high school and the middle school and school board members um, regarding the athletic and co-curricular rules and regulations, which is something we talked, to, talked about at the meeting, updating those. And just to get the ball rolling, you know, Beth and I just sat down and went through them just so we had something to, to work on. But I think one of the things we really discussed at that meeting was, you know, having the, um, the athletic policy be the same as the policy in the, dr in the drug policy. And I'm wondering how, if we haven't gone through the athletic and co-curricular rules and regulations, you're going to let people know that um, that has been changed. I think part of the discussion we had also through the, uh, when we had our athletic committee was to look at other schools too as far as their policies. Um, the way it currently stands, there, there are consequences uh, for athletes and students who are involved in co-curricular activities above and beyond what the, the uh, everyday student gets, okay, as far as suspensions and, and penalties. One thing we uh, discussed at the subcommittee meeting was the idea to try to uniform that and it may sound like we're increasing the consequences. Um, one consideration is to uh, currently, if a student um, violates uh, a school policy that warrants suspension, that it's a one-day suspension, specifically with, with substance, substances or drugs and alcohol, it's a one-day suspension with the idea of seeing a Katie Lisa, our social worker. If the student refuses to do that, it's a five-day suspension of, from school. On top of that, an athlete then is suspended for two activities or one depending on the number of games within a season. If it's a member of a, an extracurricular activity, they are suspended for a, a certain amount, a one week uh, time period. What, what the discussion uh, centered around was the idea of being more uniform and increasing suspension to two days for a first offense. And under that situation, an athlete uh, participant in extracurricular activities as well as a normal student would not be able to participate in their sport or activities for those two days, be it games, be it practices or whatever, and then be it theater, be it speech and debate. An example, say a, it happens on a, on a Friday night or a Saturday situation, and, a, and a, it's a two-day suspension that warrants a Friday and Monday that a student would not be able to participate in speech and debate on a Saturday meet until that two-day suspension is taken care of. Um, and we, again, it's still under discussion. I, I think it, it brings uh, uh, uniformity to it and consistency to everyone and also a, a much more manageable situation. Uh, but again, that's something that I think the board, the subcommittee really needs to, to talk over again. Um, the other piece to this has to do with eligibility. Uh, currently, we, we, our guidelines are based on the main principles association which says that a student must pass four major subjects at the time of eligibility per semester. Um, with next year, with the high school requiring all students to take a minimum of six subjects, uh, except that, with next year's exception being the class of 97 because of the increased credits, they will only be required to take five for one more year being the seniors, that we, sh we should look to increase uh, our concern for eligibility to say that students must pass either six subjects. The other discussion was that an athlete or a participant in co-curricular activities must pass all their subjects. Um, I would also like to add, I think we should consider students who may be IEP, that, that, that it may be written in an IEP that certain circumstances may be, uh, may, may be ad uh, adapted to that student's particular needs, but that for the, uh, the, the population of our school system that a minimum of six subjects per semester must be passed for that student to play a sport or participate in a co-curricular activity um, into that season and the next. 
That's those were the, I think those were the two major right. major issues we discussed. One on the policy on substance. Okay. Just, so just to clarify, as far as the actual rules and regulations go, there are not going to be any changes right now that affect kids when they come back to school no. in September. Correct. Kids are as is. But in the meantime, we need to have the board discussion, and the athletic committee needs to um, to talk about this. And we talked about the the, the winter season beginning. If right. changes are made, that it would be imp implemented the second semester or yep. or, or second season. Second season. Are we going to continue on with a, the athletic contract that is put out for soccer in this, the there fall, is, or is that going to be put on hold also? It is, it's it's, an, it's a, an athletic policy. Remember, we, we got away from the word contract, and there is an agreement that students read, and, and it's optional for them to sign, both they and their parents, but it's, it's read and signed by the player or, or participant. I think our, our goal was to keep that, but to, to, to refine it to the point of of uh, what we feel comfortable with concerning the keeping the consistencies of the of the consequences, I think that basically, if you look at the policy, it talks about eligibility, it talks about uh, participation in practice before playing. The, the, the basic kinds of a lot of the regulations are state uh, are established by the state anyway. I think of the 18 regulations, 10 of them are mm -hmm. come down from the main principles association, and we've added those to to adjust to our. But are those needs. different than what the standard would be for students who are not participating in athletics? Yes. There, okay. It is a policy for the, those students right, who are involved so that, in culture. That's my point. Are we going to try to have a consistent policy across all our high school students so that we would no longer need to have a separate athletic policy that would have added I think there are certain pieces that we need to have, Gail. In other words, for ath athletes, student may not be eligible if she reaches he reaches the ages of 20. I mean, that's that's just, I mean, you have there are some things we need to have in place for eligibility reasons so our kids can participate uh, against. I, guess I was school. only referring to abusive um, substance. Okay, abuse. that that's just one that's one piece of that. That's regulation. I believe it's still number 18. Or, yeah. The last piece of that in which we talk about that. Yes, the idea of. But that would be for everyone, this right. number 18. Yeah. Right, number 18 would be for all students. And for co curricular as right. well as right. athletics. Right. So, will there be that um, agreement in September, or are we going to wait this year and wait until we have come up with our formal proposal for the. My assumption winter. is we stay, with this, we stay with this policy until a formal change happens in the second semester. I, uh, well, actually, I. I guess I was thinking that as far as the the drug use, yep. uh, that what that was something that we could agree on, and we could move okay. ahead on, okay, um, to make it consistent, great for everybody. But the eligibility the piece would be something that we would right. hold off on, right? That would be fine. Uh, I had a question. It, it was my understanding as I read this that a, a, a major part of the drug policy as it stands now was basically grafted onto the end of this. Right. Is that what? Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. Yes. To provide seemed, consistent standards. It seemed very cumbersome to have all of that on top. Yeah. It, it seemed, you know, particularly if it's going to be read, you know, as an agreement or a contract or whatever you want to call it, um, it, it seemed as though it, it might simply kind of state the prohibition and then refer to the rest of the policy. Um, I think that's it, what we're looking seemed, to make that change. It, it seems like overkill to me. Yeah. The, the problem um, that we generally find, though, is that you can't say it too many times in too many contexts because people don't seem to remember it or they don't think it applied to them then or, or whatever. And, you know, people um, seem to... The other thing is the policy book is not very easily accessible to the general public and student. Um, it's in the central office. Rick was talking about printing that particular that particular policy in the right, student, student handbook. We do have a student handbook, correct. In its entirety. Which, which it, the entire piece. Yeah, I good. see what you're saying, George, but I don't think it hurts to well, hit them with it hard. I actually, um, I, I think that um, in, in some ways simple is better. A, a clear statement of prohibition um, will stick with me. If I look at five different paragraphs that I have to read, um, it really sticks out as, as sort of a graph to, to, to something that otherwise flows pretty well. Um, I, you know, I think the argument can be made that if it's too cumbersome, um, people are not going to read it either. 
Uh, we'll take it under consideration. I think we need to have a meeting and go over all of these in detail with the administrators and yeah, that, uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, this isn't here, you know, no. for a first yeah. reading or anything tonight. It was so that people on the board and we could just. It was just a discussion piece, basically, exactly. to keep this moving, um, because otherwise I'm right not sure who is going to start drafting it. So well, I have another question, yep. though, before we end this, uh, on yeah. the options of the required. No, we're not. We haven't. We're, we're not up to that yet. No, no, we're gonna. Okay, we're gonna do that now. So okay. I, I just wanted to clarify about this memo. Okay. First. Okay. So we we're all set on that. Okay. Okay. I was at this Thanks, Fred. Okay. Okay. So the other the other policy that Rick was referring to, referring to was um, policy IGD co-curricular and extracurricular programs. Right now, the uh, policy reads: the board encourages students to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities, provided that academic and behavioral guidelines established by the school are met. And what we discussed at, at the committee meeting was basically two, two different options, and we can just take that, the high school first. Um, option one was that students must be passing all their courses um, to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. And we would propose under that option that that would also apply to middle school students who are participating in athletics and co-curricular. The second option Option two uh, reads, high school students must be passing six courses to be eligible to participate in extracurricular and athletic activities. And that does just apply to the high school um, because there was the argument that middle school is a different, a different issue. Um, Charlie. Why is it a different issue? If, it, I, if it's a systemic policy, no, right. that's my question. Why is it an issue if it's a systemic policy? It, there should be an expectation of middle school students as well as, it, as high school students. It was the difference of I opinion. I happen to agree with you, but there was a the difference, difference of, of opinion. opinion. So that's why both options were presented. And I have one other question of, of Rick. The main school principals association, you said the minimum is four. four that doesn't mean that you can't exclude. No, you can, no. In fact, many, many schools, Charlie, uh, it's either all or five or six, but the, the, their basic minimum is four, but it's the local uh, school uh, has the uh, policy has the right to, to up that. They'd, that's the bare minimum, which we have just <clears throat> stayed by. Uh, it, would, it would be nice to poll the 10 surrounding communities that we that we participate in athletic events to see what their policy states. I believe, is that one of the mean? questions on the? I'm not sure it was. It would be interesting. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was an issue at that moment. Yeah. It would, yeah, it didn't come up for that meeting, but I think, frankly, to me, it doesn't make any difference to me what other towns are doing in this regard. This is, a, this is an opportunity for us to make a decision about you know, where athletics fits and um, True, fits but into I, our True, but I think what it does in the community relations is make, make them aware that we are not, we probably were one of the few schools that have a minimum. That, uh, that could very well be. And it could you know, sell any <coughs> underswell of, because I, I was getting, you know, calls and confrontations about this athletic policy and the changes and people weren't really being specific but just I think that was something we could probably find out between now and um, the next board meeting to see just where other schools are at for a most definitely just eligibility question exactly yeah. I think um, we'll find it'll 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 fluctuate but for uh, very few schools are at four it's most mostly Minimum of five. Some are, uh, you're allowed. In some cases, you're allowed to flunk a subject as opposed to the number that you must pass. You're allowed to flunk one one subject or two, but not. Uh, so it varies. But I can find that out. Again, realize some schools are on block schedule. They may have three courses a semester instead of of six or seven. So they may their their policy may may vary. Obviously, would vary to two out of three maybe. So be aware of of those kinds of scheduling. Uh, uh, agendas that, that, that may impact various schools differently. Uh, we had a very lengthy discussion about this with many, you know, well, what about this and what about this and well, no, no, you know, I mean, it was very lengthy. And so maybe we can all just sort of state where we are on it and see if we have any idea of what to come back with. There, there was a lot of discussion about um, the impact on, on whether it would, uh, um, make kids not take courses that might be a stretch for them. Um, there were 
uh, comments that you know some some kids uh, need the sports for their self for self esteem or they may be you know covered under an IEP or have other issues um, where sports is um, helpful to them. Um, I guess my my feeling about that was that um, we should state a philosophy as a community about. Um, you know, the importance of doing well at your schoolwork in order to, to have, the, you know, the time or the ability to, um, to participate in these other activities. And that some of the individual issues that come up, you can always find, you know, people who don't, don't fit into your policy for uh, whatever reason, um, for the most part are covered under, you know, special ed regulations or whatever. And, we, you know, we, we do in our schools make uh, you know, adaptations of things in very specific, structured ways, with a lot of people sitting down and dis deciding that that's for the best, in the best interest of that particular child. But as a general rule, I, f I find it just un just unconscionable that kids can be flunking courses and spending you know all this time out on the playing field. Um, I think it 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 doesn't send the right message about the importance of uh, academics. The, I'm sorry. The timing of this, I think, also with the increased requirements of students to six courses, the maximum number, of, unless, unless approved by myself, is, is seven courses. And I would hate to see that student who may be stretching his or her program by taking that one course and withdrawing from the class rather than the possibility of failing it maybe for a quarter, but knowing that the, the course is based on the entire year grade. And um, a student may be participating in a fall sport, but not a winter and spring sport where uh, that seventh course, which is, is which will be uh, you know a, a taxing program for most of our kids, but to say six, I think we're reinforcing what what our requirements are for kids to say we require you to take six, thus you must pass those six, and if you stretch for that seventh course, there may be some leniency there. But that's really up to the board as far as whether we want to say all or. or, or so or. you need six courses each semester to graduate from our high school. Correct. With the new you need program. to take six courses. And right? pass six right. courses 240 to credits. graduate. Correct. Okay. All right. Rick, you had said something about an IEP exemption or provision. Was that was there talk about putting that actually into the into the policy? We we did talk about that, but you know those those are very specific plans done done for kids individually anyway. And the, you know the point of the policy, um, you know, as we were arguing it, was that it should be as simple as possible. It should be the philosophy of the school. And of course, you know, there are all kinds of um, individual things yeah. going on with kids. You know, the positive action committees often make exceptions of one kind or another for a student on particular regulations based on that particular student's needs. So the point, there is nothing that nothing here that ties the hands of these other um, established groups. What what it would pre prevent is people, and I think you stated this that um, you know people just coming in and appealing it based on the fact that they're having you know a, a bad quarter right. or something. See, I think an example, George, would be if, if if in a student's IEP, he or she is only taking five subjects because of the the, the ability of to. to, to take a full load, does that jeopardize that student's participation in a sport because we're saying a minimum of six? So that student would be allowed to participate, in my opinion, if he or she were to pass the five subjects that the IEP stated that that uh, young man or young woman w were taking in, in eligibility. I think we need to be flexible to know that, that there may be situations, not necessarily that, that st the student in an IEP is flunking courses, but he or she may not have the, the, the minimum number of courses in a particular semester based on the uh, individual educational plan to, to allow that student to participate. So then the, then the more inclusive statement would be option one, which right. says all. all. Right. <clears throat> which would cover middle school. Yes. Accepting, that's, that is going to be, it will deter students from taking a seventh course that they might want to just see what it's like. Uh, and. How many students would not be playing sports this year? It was 27, I think, if we had held them to the six courses passing. Do you want me to find that number out right now? Again? No, I, I think you did. You <laughs> called it. I look, think it was 27 I students. It uh, I mean, given this is put forward and people will know you must be passing six courses, I, I doubt well, you're going to have 27 students right. that, that are going to have um, that problem, I would hope not. But when Ann said that we want to reflect the community's um, emphasis on high st academic standards, 
we also have to reflect the community's emphasis on athletics, and they certainly do um, support their athletic programs. Uh, I, I don't think we should say every course, passing all courses, and I know it divides the system in middle school and high school, but I think we are um, going to be making it very difficult for some people. Well, I think we should just kind of pull no the consent. board to see, um, you know, where people are comfortable going and exploring this. This is just a first reading, and because it was such a divided um, committee, you know, that's why we brought it to you with this. Uh, Can I, I want to ask Rick a question. Do many people who would be taking seven courses, do any of them have an option of doing that on a pass-fail basis, or is it for a grade? It's pretty much graded, yes. I'm trying to think of pass-fail situations we have. Andy, pass fail courses. Lighthouse for freshmen. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> might might this um, this help you a little bit with one of the problems I, I know you're you've been struggling with in the uh, your minutes from your department heads meeting of all the kids with incompletes and that kind right. of thing. Right. I, it, I, it seems like that has mushroomed into a huge problem, and it seems to me it gives kids the incentive to to get the help they need and to do their work when they're supposed to. We're putting an unbelievable burden on these teachers to, to get the kids through it. And you know, this would be a real um, you know, carrot to kids to get through their courses right the, fir the first time. And right, frankly, but by I doing don't... six, we're requiring six. If they have to pass six, there aren't going to be that many students who are going to be taking seven and eight courses. So pretty much they will be passing all why, their courses. Why would you want to set a standard where you said, Go, go and take courses and take, you know, take up a place in a, in a class where you just you know, weren't going to try or you're just dabbling in it. It just, to me, sends the wrong message. Except why take away the one activity that might be holding that kid in school? And we're basing this on, on the marking periods, right? Not a right. yearly No, mar each pass marking fail, period. Which is a relatively short period of time. So if you... It, it wipes out, it, it, depending on when it happens, it, it, in other words, if this was implemented for the fall, a student would lose the entire fall season. A winter season would be, I believe, two-thirds of the season would be lost. Right. And then spring season would, you know, would be its entirety. So it really does, though there are four ranking periods, it does impact almost an entire season. Um, one thing I would, uh, I would like to add to, add to the board is that there are a number of schools who have uh, policies in which when there is an eligibility that there is a, an appeal process, uh, I would strongly recommend we, we do not go with that. In other words, a student is given another three or four weeks to bring up his or her grade. Then the burden becomes that of the teachers to make sure work is brought in. I think we need to be real clean with whatever policy we're deciding and then it is the rank at that quarter. Um, I, can, I had a situation personally of my son who's was in the Scarborough system and was in this policy where he was failing subjects and they allowed him to play, continue in a sport, and um, it was real difficult to monitor that. It was very frustrating also. So it's, and again, I think that's more burden on the, on the teachers and the administration to, to keep that kind of paperwork. It becomes a, a paper chase more than anything. If there aren't questions, why don't we just run through the board with their consensus? Do you have a question? No. Go ahead. Or Priscilla, you have a question? Well, it occurred to me that if you're coming in in September and you're signing up for a sport that starts in September, you'll always be able to play that sport because no. you won't no, we, we did it for the spring. The spring makes you eligible for the fall. Oh. Yeah. We looked at that one, too. Charlie, do you want to just... You know, if you... We just revised the mission statement. And the mission statement says, Cape Elizabeth students will become informed, responsible citizens through a rigorous education. And if we're going to, to express that philosophy, we have to express it through all our policies. And I think the, the student that's going to take the additional course would take it anyway because I think they're academically challenged to take it. The students that, that, that are just getting by will take the minimum. I really truly believe that. And I think our increasing our, our graduation requirements is actually is actually challenging those students who try to, to minimally slide by. And, and I really think that our policy should be systemic, and it bothers me that if we go with option two, that excludes the middle school. And I think the middle school should also be challenged. 
and I think there should be consistency of policy. So I would, at this point, would support option one. Ms. Hill. I support option one. We've had lengthy discussions about this. I am an option one supporter. Gail? I'm option two. I really agree with Charlie that, that we have to funnel back all of our policies through the mission to make sure that they do apply to the mission and so forth. I also support Dr. Martin. George? Uh, I, I'm a, a great proponent of, of academic standards. Um, I, I have a level of concern um, that it truly um, uh, be responsive to, to all of the students' needs. And my sense is that going with option one, um, would, uh, would not prohibit um, certain students from participating if they were carrying a lesser caseload and so on, a lesser course load. Um, so in, in that case, I would support option one. And? And I think it's obvious I support option one. Um, well, that gives some direction to the policy committee as they bring this back for... Um, right, and obviously yeah, anybody who's been, and this does include the middle school, Nancy. Yeah, I, I know, I know. <laughs> And I wasn't at the meeting, so I wasn't one of those people that did that. But I know we've had a, a different kind of philosophy at the middle level. But um, in thinking this over, and I've been thinking it over for the last several days um, a lot, this does, is more consistent with some of the other things we're trying to change for guidelines. And if we follow all of those guidelines well, we should be able to provide for a successful seventh and eighth grade experience for all of our students. The only thing that, and we can do this as a local, um, but unlike secondary sports that are governed by guidelines from the Maine Principals Association, middle level sports are not governed by guidelines from the Maine Principals Association. We are governed by the guidelines of our conference, um, which is the Triple C. It has no eligibility requirements. And we have not been able to, we've been trying to pull our different Triple C partners uh, for eligibility. And I've only heard back from one school, and they have no eligibility requirements, and that's Falmouth. But we will continue that work to make sure, certainly here we can have, this does not prohibit us from having some guidelines, just to inform you that there is no governing body out there saying that there are specific or minimum academic standards that we must reach. Right. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks. So in, in the meantime, anybody watching at home obviously can call any board member and express their opinion on this, and it'll come back, and I'm sure they will, and um, it'll come back for second reading in August. Um, the next one is that new policy filed JJB, School Sponsorship of, school, of Social Activities, and I'll just read that. Uh, the board understands that extracurricular social events such as dances, prompts, homecoming, and class outings are a traditional part of a student's growth and development. Because such events occur outside of normal school hours and are social in nature, they demand a true partnership among the school, parents, students, and community in order to maintain the health and safety of the participants. In order to be considered a school-sponsored event covered under the school department's liability insurance, any such social event must meet certain criteria. These criteria are set forth in administrative guidelines, JJBR, which at this point in time does not exist because um, while we discussed the policy there, we, we really did feel that um, setting up those guidelines would, would be a task better left to the administrators and parents groups, and there were some, some parents at that meeting. Um, just so people know, some of the ideas that we tossed around were um, creating a parent-student school advisory group for each grade, starting at fifth grade, to sponsor social events, determining, determining a specific number of uh, parent community chaperones needed for each event, or it would be canceled. Uh, determining whether kids need to attend the, an event for the duration, buy tickets in advance, or other methods to control activity during events. Having parents and kids sign an umbrella acceptance of responsibility for social events at the beginning of the year, like a field trip slip. And doing follow-up meetings after um, events to analyze their success, discuss problems, and that type of thing. But yeah, this is your opportunity to give some input, <laughs> which Charlie has. So. Uh, your umbrella acceptance, that, that's getting back into a contract and that has got us mm -hmm. into more messes with athletic, with athletic contracts in the past and I would hate to see that brought back into a 
you know. I, th I, I think it's more literally like the field trip thing that just states that, you know, you, you know that your kid is attending these events and you're responsible. But, you know, that has just not been determined. That's just a just an idea of one way to let parents know that even though their kid is an, attending an event, um, you know, if, if something happened with, with that child, they got sick during the event or whatever, there would need to be some way uh, to reach that parent or for the parent to still be responsible for that child, even if they're on school property or on a school function. I, uh, I still have a problem with creating another contract. Yeah. It's not consistent with what, we're, what we've tried to do in other policies. And the, the other was the determine whether kids need to attend an event for duration. I think right now most events require students to be in the event at a certain time. I know in the high school, and if they leave that event, they are not allowed back in. Um, some of those, they already buy tickets in advance. Um, for things like proms and that kind of thing. Otherwise, they don't get into the prom because it all has to do with the budgeting of the prom. So uh, those, kind of, those kind of things. Well, that's just, There's you know, these were just place. things yeah, we batted around. And yeah, some of them are being done. Some might not be a good idea. But just to give, you know, examples of um, the kinds of things we talked about. No, the flavor was to really involve the students and a lot, the, too. And the, the students and the parents. But the students would be helping these events function, getting chaperones, those kind of things. That I understand. But as far as when you get into guidelines, which are going to be stated, I, I have a problem with a contract. And that's yep. what it sounds like. I think it was, as Ann said, not necessarily a contract. But if you can't be reached and your child needs to be picked up, what would be names of neighbors to call and those kind of things or you know, whatever. But those should be part of school record anyway. Well, maybe so that's why all duplicate, we'll, you know, yeah. why duplicate? And actually what I want to see is all this onto a database anyway so that we are <laughs> right. having to redo it every year. Though obviously when you're talking about a nighttime activity, your, you know, your chaperones or whatever may be different. They may be, you know, specific to one night as opposed to something else. But, you know, I'm sure this is something um, we can work on. that they, they can work through. So I guess specifically right now we need um, feedback on the policy itself so it can come back for second reading and in the meantime the administrators can kind of keep us informed and if we could move on this obviously quickly it would be great. well I think it states a school and community partnership which is also part of our new mission state right <laughs> any comments changes different language no wonderful so nice to and these clean things did it go. Um, and the last one is the affirmative action policy, which as I stated before, it's just the first page that says non-discrimination. Um, that's the first read for our actual policy, and then the rest of it would be the backup plan. And I did talk to George about this today, and he has um, expertise in this area and, and made some suggestions. So. Um, I suggested maybe he could work with Belinda to update and firm this up. He's, he really feels um, that this, the plan is not quite up to speed at this point. So we'll just say that the, this statement is the, uh, the first read, and George will work on the backup with Great. Belinda. Great. Thank you. Is there any other feedback for George as he works on it? I was asking for board members if they had any other feedback for you as you start to work on it. Having done the alcohol and drug abuse, I'd <laughs> gladly give You're it to <laughs> Right. Thank you, George. Um, and that was the last That's one. That's it. Correct. Uh, the next item on the agenda is resignations, Connie. Well, I'm really sorry to end this meeting with resignations uh, from three people. Uh, is wonderful and is really vital to our system. Um, Barbara Cannell at the high school, foreign languages, Betsy Wiley at the high school, the English department, and Gail Adsett at the high school science department. Uh, as I said in my notes, I have had conversations with them. I think they would probably welcome an opportunity to uh, talk to any of you. Um, all I can say at this point is that they have given richly of what they have, uh, both their knowledge and their concern and care for young people. 
Uh, they've done remarkable things for our young people and they will be sorely missed. We wish them well and um, say thank you. Are there other comments? Ann? I was really sad to see these um, resignations and um, I, I had the great pleasure of uh, taking a trip to Atlanta to visit um, a, a high school um, with uh, Gail Adset and Betsy Wiley and um, they were just such a pleasure to talk to. They, they can talk education all the time. They're really engaged in it. Um, exciting teachers. Uh, they gave a lot to that school when we were down there and um, I will sorely miss them. Are there other comments, Charlie? I also that year spent time with both Gail and um, Betsy uh, when we attended the National Coalition of Excellence in Schools um, in Philadelphia. And uh, three of my children have had uh, Gail Adset as a teacher. And I think of my first child who went through the system who actually got turned on to science by Gail. And, you know, she, all of these people I have worked with over the past seven years and uh, have worked with um, Barbara Canal in the implementation of the FLESS program because I was on the board when we put that into place and remember going into her classroom and watching the dynamics that was going on in a, in a, in a fifth grade class and it was exciting. And it, it's with deep regret that, uh, that we will accept these resignations. Any other comments? I would also like to express my deep regret um, to have these three wonderful teachers leaving our system. Is there a motion? Charlie? I move acceptance of the resignations of Barbara Connell, Betsy Wiley, or Elizabeth Wiley, and Gail Adshead with regret. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a request to enter executive session for the purpose of discussing negotiations and the superintendent search. I think we need to leave that there for some need to leave it there. Thank you. Um, Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? 7 0. Thank you. Who was the second? Oh, everybody. Everybody. Uh, <laughs> anybody. <laughs> Ann was the first I, I heard, so I wrote her down. I think we definitely have to Would you pass that down to Mary, please? Mary, I think that's the same. Thank you.